You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. We're going to kick off this episode that we've entitled Justice Delayed with a song and a quick story. First, the song. If that sounds sort of familiar, it should. It's Led Zeppelin's Cashmere, which I sing by myself in the car all the time, as covered by a marching band called the Cadets. And we bring up this song in this fashion because we play trivia. Yes. Now, when it's just Drift Glass and me playing, we're always a solid fourth place finisher. Absolutely. Uh, (laughs) But when our whole Methodist church team plays... We've got a sports ringer, we've got geography experts, and when we as a group play, we almost always come in first or second. Yeah. Sometimes the research librarian team shows up and then we're dead. We come in second. Well, we have to go get in their heads during the breaks. (laughs) Oh, okay. But anyway, the reason we bring this up is every once in a while, there will be a category where you have to identify a song as covered by a marching band. Yes. And this usually gets people really scratching their heads because they're playing the song by the marching band and you know this song. But Mm -hmm. since it's so out of context and it's played by a marching band, you don't know what it is right away. And then all of a sudden it clicks in and the melody kicks in and you look at each other and go, oh, wait, I know that's Fleetwood Mac. Or that's 21 Pilots, or that's Portugal the Man, or the theme from Man from Uncle, or SpongeBob, or whatever it is. It's the aha moment. It's the aha moment of I've got it. And so we're leading with this marching band, Led Zeppelin. Is it Led Zeppelin? Yeah, Cashmere Cover. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We're leading with this because of how often words like unprecedented have gotten thrown around during the Trump years. The unprecedented corruption, the unprecedented contempt for the rule of law, the unprecedented cowardice of Republicans in the face of an obvious monster. But here on No Fair Remembering Stuff, we have a different take. Instead of shrugging Trump off as that black swan event with no precedent, we look at each other and say, but we know this song. We've heard this song before, but where? But where indeed, Blue Gal? Where have we heard this song before? So let's all of us curl up nice and snuggy and hop in the Wayback Machine and set the dial for April of 2005. And a couple of citations from one of the very earliest blog posts I ever wrote back in the golden days of blogging. This actually started off as a comment at the late Steve Gilliard's news blog. And when I finally struck out on my own, when he finally threw me out and said, go start your own goddamn blog, um, I used this this post as a a starter dough. These comments as sort of starter dough to get myself going. It's entitled, Representative Delay Preps the Beds for the GOP's Big Sleep. And it features a shot of Pennywise the Clown from the TV movie It, Digging Graves. So, pardon me while I clear my throat. (laughs) And here we go. You're, you're back in 2005. Remember, 2005. The little P in politics of this is fascinating. The fact that over the long run, the GOP is demographically and electorally doomed to become the minority Thurston Howell party again. Either when the fundy shining path rebels that make up their margin of victory make one too many batshit demands or are told no once too often. If you want to get a clear picture of how this will look, 
go rent Fatal Attraction or play Misty for me because I'm not going to be ignored, George. (laughs) So either they take their bat and stomp back disgustedly to Mordor or a handful of moderate Republicans get so freaked out by the Randall Terry wing of the party that they bolt or they stay home. Who is Randall Terry again? Uh, Randall Terry was the founder of Operation Rescue, the anti-choice terrorist organization. And it's funny, isn't that strange how 17 years later, Randall Terry has finally gotten his way and Roe versus Wade has been tossed out? Guess who won the fight between the Thurston Howell wing of the party and the Shining Path wing of the party? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to 2005. But in the short run, Tom DeLay is now a household name and I've been waiting for 10 years for that to happen. And I've always been amazed that Republicans had no fucking clue who he was, even though you tell them five or 500 times over and over again who this guy was and what he was doing. All RAM and no hard drive with these people. So every GOP leader knows the Gingrich lesson by now. No matter how much the membership owes you, they will go absolutely lower the flies on your piggy ass the minute you become a measurable liability. And Newt was so completely, I am the Reich, that he would have been perfectly happy to go into the bunker and fight it out until the GOP was raised to rubble had he not been stopped by his own House Republicans. And since the suddenly huge liability named Tom DeLay is now just telltale heart thundering away under the GOP floorboards, threatening to drown out everything else, the question is, will the same dynamic play twice? Well, Tom DeLay ain't Gingrich. He learned from that episode, and they don't call him the hammer for his shipwright skills. He spent a decade forcibly collecting GOP testicles and cashing them in his private Crown Royal bag. At the slightest provocation, he will politically and personally destroy anyone who does not bend a deep knee to his Gorgon awfulness. Does any of this sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Back to 2005. And both the Texas and National Republican parties have shown absolute craven willingness to rewrite the rules on the fly anytime the beast's wet bar needed to be restocked with virgin's blood or whenever a law or policy might threaten to cinch in the bottomless lust he and his stooges have for power, money, trinkets, and perks, even a trifle. So, ha ha ha, they've kind of disarmed themselves to accommodate him, and now they're very much stuck up on that very windy gibbet with him. So if you were running in 2006 and playing, how do I save my pink Republican skin while delay is holding up your ass as hostage, what do you do? Well, here's the problem. You've got to time it just right. (laughs) If you jump away from hair delay too soon, he'll blow your fucking head off. Jump too late and your face will be morphed into Tom Delay, into Randall Terry, into, I don't know, Osama Bin Laden, in every ad, every day, for the entire election cycle. And that was me in 2005. Reminds me of a lot of things, Drift Glass. Yeah, kind of brings to mind a lot of current events, doesn't it, Blue Gal? Yeah, like this is exactly the same dynamic that the Republican Party has been operating under since Donald Trump came down the escalator. And the base of the party announced, yes, the chosen one has come at last. (laughs) It's so obvious that even Tom DeLay sees the parallels. I didn't know he was still alive, but it turns out he looks at the current political situation with Donald Trump entirely ass backwards and through his booze dimmed eyes, but he sees them. And who asked him about this? The Washington Times, not the Washington Post, the Mooney Washington Times did this week published, quote, Trump indictment follows Democratic playbook says former House GOP Majority Leader Tom DeLay. We were researching, we were doing research for this show, and I I found this, and I laughed so hard. It just fell into our lap, you know? Yep, yep. So here's the article. Quote, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who has indicted former President Donald Trump, is following a well-trod Democratic playbook. Just ask former Rep Tom DeLay who nearly two decades ago was the Trumpian figure at the core of the conservative movement. The Washington Times says it like it's a good thing. Yeah, I know. It's hilarious. 
using his post as a House Majority Leader to take conservative ideas and forge them into election-winning Republican policies. Yeah. That was until a crusading district attorney brought iffy legal charges that knocked Mr. DeLay out of his post. Uh Uh-oh! Oh, no. Mr. DeLay was eventually convicted, but a nearly unanimous state appeals court they don't say in Texas. Yeah, they don't mention full the of Texas Republicans part. from mm-hmm. Texas tossed out his conviction. Unquote. Mm-hmm. So he was completely off the hook, right, Driftglass? That's right. Well, there was a dissenting opinion about this is all bullshit, and the prosecutor was like, you know, if it's if it's illegal, it's illegal to take bribes, except if your party's the one who runs the government, in which case you run the courts, in which case apparently it's not illegal. So. Yeah, Texas. But wait, there's more drift glass. Like Trump, Tom DeLay was also involved in a large corrupt conspiracy that was investigated by the DOJ and the FBI. This is from the, a deep dive investigation by Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington crew, who has been kept very busy during the Trump years. Yeah, we love them. Entitled The FBI's Case Against Tom DeLay. Mm-hmm. Quote, In the mid-2000s, a scandal swept Washington centered around the larger-than-life lobbyist Jack Abramoff and top Republican members of Congress and staff who had benefited for years from his largesse. When the dust settled, the Justice Department had secured at least 20 guilty pleas or trial convictions based on evidence the FBI uncovered in a wide-ranging public corruption investigation initiated in 2004. The investigation netted not only Jack Abramoff, who pleaded guilty in January 2006 to conspiracy, aiding and abetting honest services mail fraud and tax evasion, and was sentenced to 48 months in prison, unquote. And Drift Glass, when he got out of prison, he got a conservative imprint book deal. Yes, he sure did. And he had a book party at yes, someone's sure house. Do you remember whose house it was? I, I I I dread the answer to this question because I think I know. I think it's the Clintons. Oh no. no. He had it at Tucker Carlson's house. Oh, that's right. I they had valet parking at Tucker Carlson's that's, house. That's right. For tu- for for Jack Abramoff's book. Hey Jack, where you been? Oh, I've been to <laughs> London to visit the Queen there, Tucker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, welcome in, Jack. Come on back. Uh, yeah. So then it turned out that this FBI public corruption investigation had also implicated Tom DeLay and two of his former congressional henchmen. Quote, also implicated was Jack Abramoff's close friend, former House Majority Leader Tom DeLay, Republican of Texas. Those convicted included two former congressional senior aides to Mr. DeLay, Tony Rudy and Michael Scanlon, unquote. Uh, You know, Blue, I was thinking about this. And the reason Donald Trump's scandals are more efficient than this, but not Uh different than this, is that because Donald Trump is Tom DeLay and Jack Abramoff all rolled into one. Mixed together. Yes. Just just the worst of both of them welded together into the perfect representation of what every Republican aspires to be. But. Way back then, things were looking pretty bad for DeLay until, in a surprise announcement made by Tom DeLay himself, he said the DOJ had told him they would not be bringing criminal charges against him in connection with his relationship with Mr. Abramoff, despite having been in Abramoff's orbit as one of Washington's top power brokers, and despite Abramoff finding all kinds of backdoor ways of putting cash and gifts and expensive trips into DeLay's pocket. This left the question of why the DOJ decided not to go after DeLay when it was willing to go after everyone around Tom DeLay hanging in the air. And that became the subject of what crew described as their, quote, seven-plus-year saga as we fought to compel DOJ to reveal publicly why DeLay escaped scot-free despite the significant public record documenting he'd had a hand in a great many quid pro quo arrangements, unquote. Now, we're going to include the links to the whole report in our show notes, so don't worry. You can read it for yourself if you want. Crew reports that their initial request for documents from the FBI under the Freedom of Information Act was flatly rejected. Crew responded that, again, like Trump, 
DeLay himself had revealed publicly that he'd been under investigation by the DOJ. So there was no need to protect him from the stigma of being associated with a law enforcement investigation. The DOJ still refused to budge. This was followed by extensive litigation, including two appeals to the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit before Crew finally obtained at least some of its requested documents. The FBI's response to Crew's FOIA request for records about the four-year investigation yielded a total of 328 pages. Of those, 131 pages, many with redactions, were eventually released. And what Crew was able to piece together from the limited information it could gather was this. This is a quote from the end of that report. Quote, A picture of a gun-shy Department of Justice emerges from the FBI records reeling from its disastrous prosecution of Senator Stevens and focused more on the case's perceived weaknesses than its strengths in order to justify its decision not to prosecute him. The Department of Justice, in its own deliberations, may have engaged in more thorough analysis of the pros and cons of their case, but the documents the FBI produced to crew do not reflect this. Instead, they reveal that after a four-year investigation, DOJ quietly closed its case against one of the most powerful men in Congress, letting him off the hook for his years of shady deals and actions on behalf of Jack Abramoff and his many clients, unquote. This picture of a DOJ that was too scared of political repercussions to bring a powerful, dangerous, and deeply corrupt Republican to justice from 17 years ago, Dirk Glass. Yep. Practically begs to be read side by side next to this damning Washington Post article that everybody's been talking about this uh, week. This week, this very week. The title is FBI Resisted Opening Probe into Trump's Role in January 6th for more than a year. Yeah. And we recommend that you go read that Washington Post yeah. article. It's long and detailed and utterly damning and exactly yeah. the same as it was 17 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't want to be political. Yep. Which means you're being political. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Trump and delay, we find deep institutional resistance to holding corrupt and dangerous, remember this word, Republicans accountable. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. In addition to the criminality of Tom DeLay, like Trump, there's also the matter of the open, smirking, moral bankruptcy of Tom DeLay, the sort of thing that was supposed to matter to the character counts party of personal responsibility. For that, we turn to the Abramoff DeLay Marianas Island scandal, which was so cruel and grotesque, if you didn't know DeLay was fronting for it, you swear it had to be something Trump dreamed up. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Jared. Yeah. Oh, no, that, <laughs> it's got Jared's you know filthy hands all over it. Yeah. This is from CNN in 2006, back when CNN did such things. Quote, To grasp the moral bankruptcy of the public Tom DeLay, the House Majority Leader, you have only to know about Frank Murkowski and Cy Pan. Frank Murkowski is the governor of Alaska, but from 1980 to 2002, he was a conservative Republican senator from Alaska. How conservative? His voting record earned him zero ratings from organized labor's AFL-CIO and the Liberal Americans for Democratic Action, and perfect 100s from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the American Conservative Union. But as chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, Frank Murkowski became furious at the abusive sweatshop conditions endured by workers, overwhelmingly immigrants, in the U.S. territory of the Northern Mariana Islands, of which Saipan is the capital. Because they were produced in a territory of the United States, garments traveled tariff-free and quota-free, to the profitable U.S. market and were entitled to display the coveted Made in the USA label among the manufacturers that had profited from the unfree labor market on the island were Tommy Hilfiger USA, Gap, Calvin Klein, and Liz Claiborne. Moved by the sworn testimony of U.S. officials and human rights advocates that the 91% of the workforce who were immigrants from China, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, were being paid barely half the U.S. minimum hourly wage 
and were forced to live behind barbed wire in squalid shacks minus plumbing, work 12 hours a day, often seven days a week, without any of the legal protections U.S. workers are guaranteed. Murkowski wrote a bill to extend the protection of U.S. labor and minimum wage laws to the workers in the U.S. territory of the Northern Marianas. So compelling was the case for change, the Alaska Republican marshaled that in early 2000, the U.S. Senate unanimously passed the Murkowski Worker Reform Bill. Unanimously. Unanimous. Unanimous U.S. Senate passage. And this is from the same article. Continuing what Blue Gal just said, quote, But one man primarily stopped the U.S. House from even considering that worker reform bill. Then House Republican Whip Tom DeLay. According to law firm records recently made public, lobbyist Jack Abramoff paid millions to stop reform and keep the status quo, met personally at least two dozen times with DeLay on the subject in one two-year period. The DeLay staff was often in daily contact with Abramoff. DeLay traveled with his family and staff over New Year's of 1997 on an Abramoff scholarship endowed by his client, the government of the territory, to the Marianas, where golfing, yes, golfing, and snorkeling were enjoyed. DeLay fully approved of the working and living conditions. The Texan salute to the owners and Abramoff's government clients was recorded by ABC TV News, quote, You're a shining light for what is happening to the Republican Party, and you represent everything that is good about what we are trying to do in America and leading the world in the free market system, unquote. Later, DeLay would tell the Washington Post Julius Alperin that the low-wage anti-union conditions of the Marianas constituted, quote, a perfect petri dish of capitalism. It's like my Galapagos Island, unquote. Two years earlier, ABC News' Brian Ross had uncovered the fact that in addition to horrific working conditions, quote, many Chinese workers are forced to sign secret agreements known as shadow contracts before they leave China, severely and in some ways illegally restricting their activities while on American soil. For example, workers are forbidden to participate in any religious or political activity or to ask for salary increases or even fall in love and get married much as might be the case in mainland China, unquote. And if a female worker ever got pregnant while living as virtual slaves, management would routinely coerce them into having abortions. So, Trump and DeLay, were both of these men just anomalies? You know, freaks of nature that came out of nowhere, blue gal? Clearly not, Driftglass. No, clearly not, they were not. Both Trump and DeLay were the inevitable end products of the political culture of the modern Republican Party. In 1994, after 40 years in the wilderness, Republicans took control of the House of Representatives thanks to the convergence of two rising forces on the right. One, Newt Gingrich's relentless slash-and-burn style of politics, and two, the 24-7 rage and hate machine of conservative talk radio led by Rush Limbaugh. Gingrich served as speaker from 1995 to 1999 in a tumultuous rule marked by a pair of government shutdowns lasting nearly a month combined, dozens of ethics complaints, an attempted leadership coup by fellow Republicans, and a party-line impeachment vote against Bill Clinton for lying about sexual infidelity, mm -hmm. even as Gingrich himself was cheating on his then-second wife with its then- third mistress. You remember her. Oh, I do. She became Trump's ambassador to the Vatican. To the Vatican. Yes, yeah, and, and he became the layabout gentleman of the Vatican. Of the Vatican. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Gingrich expected the Clinton impeachment would solidify Republican control of the House, but instead Republicans got their asses kicked in the 1998 midterms. And Gingrich resigned, saying, I'm not willing to preside over people who are cannibals. And wow, was that was never, nice. I'm sorry, say that again. Wow, that was nice. And he was never heard from again. Sorry, he was, Drift Glass. He was? A lot. A lot. Oh, yeah. oh, that's right. He was the most popular guest on Meet the Press for, for an entire year under David yep. Gregory. Oh, that's right. I yep. totally forgot that, Blue Gal. No, you didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> After Gingrich came Bob Livingston who didn't even last one full Scaramucci after Hustler publisher Larry Flint put out a $1 million bounty 
for tips about GOP leaders having sex outside their marriages. He had the votes all lined up and then was outed as an adulterer. Oh, that's oh, so sad. Oh, that's so, so sad and unfair. And made worse for him by the fact that he had so publicly demanded that Clinton resign. He dropped his speaker bid and soon resigned from Congress altogether in 1999. After confessing to his colleagues, I very much regret having to tell you that I've been flinted. Because Goodness it couldn't gracious. be his personal responsibility. Try it's Larry again. Flint's try, fault. Stop, stop, let's try that again. I very much regret having to tell you that I've been flinted. So it's not his personal responsibility. It's all Larry Flint's fault. Right. And how I miss Larry Flint putting bounties on Republicans for dirt. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the good old days as far as I'm concerned. But goodness gracious, Blue Gal, are you trying to tell me that all Republicans in leadership were moralizing hypocrites? Yes, Drift Glass. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> well, you're coming through loud and clear, Blue Gal. <laughs> because after... Bob Livingston came Dennis Hastert. Oh, yeah. From Illinois. Yeah. Illinois' own Dennis Hastert. Now, he did serve the longest of any of them, but uh-oh, he turned out to be a child molester. Yes, he did. Not a drag queen, a no, child molester. a child molester. That's right. And he went on to serve more than a year in prison for the serial sexual abuse of boys on his wrestling team. That mm -hmm. is not funny. No. Uh, and also, he pleaded guilty to... Financial crimes related to the hush money he paid to try to keep the sex abuse secret. Yeah. But the power behind Hastert was Tom DeLay, who was clearly not an anomaly, but very much at home in the larger Republican culture of moralizing frauds, hypocrites, and perverts. DeLay was seen as too partisan to become speaker. Can you imagine? I know. But I acted know. as the House GOP's true center of power in the Hastert era serving first as whip and then from 2002 as majority leader. DeLay also launched the K Street Project, helping turn the GOP House into a service organization for lobbying interests. And that culminated in the Jack Abramoff corruption scandal. It, it's, it's weird how when you plant corn, corn grows. And when you <laughs> plant corruption, corruption grows. So, so just like Trump, Republican leadership back in DeLay's time were either creepy loyalists or cowards who were too craven to take him on and lived on the hope that someone, somewhere, would rid them of this troublesome leader. This, from a 1998 Slate article entitled A Bug's Life, is exterminator-turned-representative Tom DeLay, the most powerful man on Capitol Hill. See if this sounds familiar. Quote, No one likes him, says one leadership staffer, but everyone fears him. He has translated those techniques into fundraising. DeLay, a.k.a. The Hammer, has achieved the impossible. His fundraising shakedowns have made people feel sorry for D.C. lobbyists. But his fervent principles frequently overcome his sense. In 1995, DeLay, who has despised environmental laws since his termite-killing days, tried to eviscerate the EPA by attaching riders to appropriations bills. The writers not only failed, but also confirmed the image of congressional Republicans as anti-environmental extremists and gave the Clinton-Gore campaign a potent 1996 campaign issue. The writers even annoyed businesses that would have benefited from them. His proposals were so extreme and so unsuccessful that he spoiled future opportunities for less controversial reforms. Unquote. So, what about Republican voters, Blue Gal? Surely the base of the party of personal responsibility is going to hold Republican office holders responsible for their conduct, right? Am I right? No, you're not right, Drift Class. No, no, I don't. This is from NBC News in 2006. Now, if you hear a reporter scratching their head about why is Donald Trump still the Republican base's favorite candidate for president in 2024, yeah. listen to this. Quote, for all of the convictions and guilty pleas it produced, the investigative articles it has spawned, and the stomach ulcers it has given Republican consultants, it's easy to forget this one thing about the Jack Abramoff lobbying scandal. So far, no politician linked to it has lost at the ballot box. In May, Representative Bob Ney, Republican of Ohio, won his primary. 
despite his contested primary, by the way, despite allegations that Abramoff's clients showered him with campaign contributions and a golf trip to Scotland uh-huh. in exchange for official acts. Can you imagine, Drift Glass? I know. And a month later, so did Senator Conrad Burns, Republican of Montana, who had raked in more campaign contributions from Abramoff and his clients than any other member of Congress. Even Tom DeLay, Republican of Texas, who resigned from Congress in part because of his ties to the lobbyist, still won his primary earlier in the year. Of course, now these politicians could very well lose in November. Analysts say that Ney and Burns are quite vulnerable in the general election contest, and DeLay could still wind up on the ballot after a recent court ruling But it's still striking that the Abramoff affair hasn't produced a single campaign casualty in the Republican Party, unquote. Mm -hmm. But what about the opinions of the most important people of all, Drift Glass? Yeah, the most important. You know, how did leading conservative pundits, and, and one leading conservative pundit in particular, react to Tom DeLay stinking up the joint? I appreciate Blue Gal putting the T up. And putting the little ball in front and just saying, <laughs> just hit it. Just hit the thing. You knew we were you knew we were going here. If you know us at all. You know you where Drift Glass out, was going with you, this, you right? You knew that this wandering river would eventually find its way to Mr. David Brooks of the New York Times. Yep. Um, the most, at the time, and still to a certain extent true, the most ubiquitous, respected, mainstream conservative pundit in America at the time had two different reactions eight months apart. First, in January of 2006, he wrote an angry laundry list in the New York Times of procedural and administrative tweaks that Republicans needed to hurry up and pass before the poor dumb voters started to catch on that they were all awful. 17 years ago, his column ended like this, quote, for God's sakes, Republicans, show a little moral revulsion. Back in the dim recesses of my mind, I remember a party that thought of itself as a reform, or even a revolutionary movement. That party used to be known as the Republican Party. I wonder if it still exists, unquote. First, no, it does not, and it never did, and shut up. For God's sakes, just shut up and go away. Second, I would like to note for the record that I took time out of my busy schedule all the way back in 2006 to tell David Brooks, as a friendly friend, exactly (laughs) how to reform his Republican Party, if he really wanted to save it. Here was my advice in January of 2006, 17 years ago. Quote, it's so easy. Just dump the bigots, David. Tell the racist to hit the fucking bricks. Stop the clown car and kick the science-hating, gay-bashing Christopaths to the curb. Oh, but then you'd lose, wouldn't you? That's the real dirty little secret behind all of this. You know that if you really actually flush the scum of the earth your southern strategists have so carefully cultivated down the drain, your Republican Party wouldn't win another election anywhere for another generation. And your party of God and used car salesmen cannot accept that, which is why you will always have Abramoffs and Delays and Ralph Reeds and Donald Trumps hag-riding the GOP. You know it, and more importantly, they know it, which is why they own you. They are the emergent and inevitable result of the hate-driven moral absolutism, racism, and pathologically perverted variant of Christianity that is the bedrock of the modern GOP. And as long as they are allowed to remain the pillar of your party, it will always end in tears, unquote. That was me 17 years ago, Blue Gal. But David Brooks did not listen to my advice. He never does. You're kidding. He never does. And it always ends very, very badly. Instead, by August of that same year, he had invented a brand new villain to be mad at. A villain that included, but was not limited to, Tom DeLay. And that enemy was, drumroll please, both sides. (laughs) This is excerpted from his column entitled Party Number Three. Quote, There are two major parties on the ballot, but there are three major parties in America. There's the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the McCain-Lieberman Party. All were on display Tuesday night. The McCain-Lieberman Party begins with a rejection of the Sunni-Shiite style of politics itself 
It rejects those whose emotional attachments to their party is so all-consuming, it becomes a form of tribalism. Notice that 17 years later, you can't swing a dead cat around the Never Trump universe without hitting the word tribalism. And who believe the only way to get American voters to respond is through aggression and stridency? Oh no, not aggression and stridency. <laughs> the flamers in the established parties tell themselves that their enemies are so vicious that they have to become vicious too. They rationalize their behavior by insisting that circumstances have forced them to shelve their integrity for the good of the country. They imagine that once they have achieved victory through pulverizing rhetoric, they will return to the moderate and nuanced sensibilities they think they still possess. And here's the money quote, Blue Gal. Mm -hmm. But the experience of Tom DeLay and the Netroots Tom DeLay and the Democratic <laughs> Party amply <laughs> demonstrates that means determine ends. Hyperpartisans may have started with subtle beliefs, but their beliefs led them to partisanship, and their partisan led them to malice, and malice made them extremist. And pretty soon, they were no longer the same people, unquote. <sighs> yeah. He's been doing that for more than 17 years. Yep. Yes, he has. So the next time some Joe Scarborough in your office or at your knitting group or at the bar starts to bend your ear about how awesome the Republican Party used to be before Trump, please feel free to whip out this podcast and play at 100 decibels. Yeah, just put the earbuds in them and blast them with this thing because I am so fucking sick and tired of hearing about the good old days before Trump from people who actually were around when Tom DeLay was running the party and damn well know better. And all the people who have the memory of fruit flies who, who have no memory of anything that happened before last week. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you have to tell them because th they won't believe this. They don't even know who Al Gore was or Bill yeah. Clinton. They have no idea who, who Gingrich was or who Tom DeLay was. All they know is what they see Tom Nichols and Charlie Sykes tell them on MSNBC about the past. And all they know about the past is it all started in 2016. And before that, everything was peaches and cream. The end. And you know who could tell them otherwise are black voters. I mean, oh, really. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I, I, as this goes on and these investigations go on, particularly in terms of um, changing the votes and pretending that 2020 was not a free and fair election and we're going to have alternate electors and we're going to get the vice president to turn us down. And we've got a senator, we've got Ted Cruz willing right. to object mm -hmm. in the vote count. So we got our senator this time. You realize that Bush v. Gore was a dry run for Trump. Sure. Yep, absolutely. And Trump learned something from Bush v. Gore. He did. He did. Create a whole lot of chaos. Get a, Make sure you have a senator this time who can object to the ballots from certain states, because that's mm -hmm. what they didn't have. They right. Bush didn't have that. And then scream bloody murder about voter fraud. Be prepared to, as many of Trump's uh, henchmen wanted to do, declare martial law mm -hmm. and make it so chaotic that the only thing the Supreme Court can do is keep the sitting president in office. Right. Throw it, well, throw it to for the another Congress. four years. Throw it to the House. Throw it to the, yeah. Who knows? And, and then the whole thing about, well, does anyone know what the rules are about who gets to vote in the House? And yeah. You know what? Alaska has as many votes as California. Mm -hmm. Each delegation mm -hmm. gets one or two votes, I think. So, mm -hmm. oh, so we're going to level this out by giving the Republicans who have a numerical minority mm -hmm. um, more than equal footing because there's yeah. there's more small states with more of those. We're going to let votes. land vote. That's what right. we're going to do. Exactly. And yeah. and you know this is 1963 without the dogs and the fire hoses. Mm -hmm. This really mm -hmm. is just, you know, we're not going to let your you vote. And if you vote, we're not going to let you let it be counted. We're not going to count it. Broward County didn't get counted mm -hmm. in Florida. Yep. They stopped the recount. The Supreme Court stopped the recount because what was left was Broward County, which is right. black. And we don't want to count that. We don't want to count that. Well, and, and this is a little reminder that um, this is always, this has been going on for decades. The Republican Party has been heading this way for decades. They have been... Mm -hmm. Cheaters and liars, they relied on goons like Ralph Reed and Tom DeLay. The people always back them until it's almost too late, until it's too late, and then they never heard of these people. But the biggest weapon in their arsenal is forgetfulness, mm -hmm. is wiping the slate clean so that no one can pretend that, that so no one can state with, with certainty, no one can bring facts to the table 
that this has gone on for a really long time. So they can sit there and say, no, 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 this is not true. This just happened a few years ago. It just kicked off yesterday. We're not that party at all. And these people remember the clan. They mm-hmm. remember, they have, I, I've said this before, they have perfect uh, memories. They are masters in uh, civil rights law right up until about 1962. Mm-hmm. And then their memories get real fuzzy. And then suddenly they kick back in during Barack Obama's term when he was a Kenyan usurper who divided the country. And Tom DeLay, right down the memory hole. When Tom DeLay was in office, when he was doing this shit, I had Republicans I was working with, and I knew way more about their party than they did. They had no idea who this guy was. They had no idea what he had done. All they knew was Rush Limbaugh was telling them on the radio that people like me were dirty, rotten, commie, filthy liars. And we couldn't be trusted with anything. And you got to vote Republican because Republicans are fighters. And they'll fight these dirty, rotten, commie Democrats. And that's all you need to know. Also, feminists are feminazis. And liberals are libtards. And Barack the Magic Negro, blah, 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 blah. And yeah. they and, and they don't want to know about this. You tell them about this. And there's a whole arsenal of whataboutisms laying at their feet. Well, what about what about Hunter Biden? Huh? huh? What about Solyndra? Huh? What about all the babies that Democrats murder? And at some point, it's just so fucking exhausting to go down the same road with the same morons who have the same excuses, who you realize once you get to the end of that road for the fifth or sixth or hundredth time, oh, they're never going to change. They're never going to deal with the facts of their party. They don't give a shit that, that Donald Trump is a traitor. They like the fact that he's a corrupt criminal. They want him to be on the, up on that wall. They enjoy the fact that people like you and me are terrified this country is going to tip into an autocracy because they're shoving it in that direction. They like that. It thrills them. So stop trying to reason with them. But if you catch one of them at a party or at a knitting group or at the bar going on about the good old days, slap a couple of earbuds on their heads and turn this thing up to 100 decibels and play them the history of Tom fucking DeLay. And don't forget, we're always looking for more Patreons to make this podcast fly. Please, if you can afford to support us in that way, do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And we thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. DGBG Productions.